Good evening. This is the January edition of Operation City on the Hill. I'm the host, Robert Maynard, and tonight's show is going to be entitled Schools of Hellas. And this is going to be an ongoing series in um, what has been an attempt to make us cognizant of the of the trends that are that we're seeing as we enter into an information age of digital economy. And I'm making I have been making the argument that a lot of these trends are paralleling the type of lifestyle that we had during the Jeffersonian age before the industrial age. And my argument is the industrial age institutionalized us and conditioned us to be dependent upon large institutions, large government, large businesses, large school systems. And that in order to prosper in the information age digital economy and make sure that people don't get left behind and maximize the benefits and minimize the pitfalls, we need to overcome this industrial age mindset of being set for life and being taken care of by these large institutions. And tonight I'm going to be dealing with the educational factor that's involved here because the education system we have now was is largely a product of the industrial age and it was preparing preparing us to be successful during the industrial age. And I'm going to get into that a little bit and I'm going to explain what I see as a possible alternative it which is similar to the, the education system pre-industrial age. And I'm gonna look at some of the aspects of that system that might bode well for an education system in the information age where we have so many different ways of educating ourselves that we don't have to equate schooling with education. And that's the biggest issue now. We've become so institutionalized that we create, we create the process of education with the institution of schooling. And that's m my focus now. I'm going to deal a lot with a book by James Taylor Gatto, who was John, Ta John Taylor Gatto, I'm sorry, who was, um, he was like New York City School Teacher of the Year several times, and he became like National School Teacher of the Year. And he, was, he taught in New York City school systems, and then he retired, and he wrote this book called The Underground History of American Education. And... One section in that book was called Schools of Hellas. Now, by Hellas, he's referring to the classical Greek city-state civilization, the Athens of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and the Greek, the Greek playwrights and the, the invention of, you know, the development of science and literature and all. It, it was one of the most brilliant civilizations the world has ever seen. And our founding, <clears throat> a lot of our founders thought the education system and the philosophy of education that they followed was one that, that our founders wanted to emulate. And so they, well, you've got this, these little Greek city-states, and they basically did something that is very unusual in that they had a sense, there was a strong sense of individual initiative and in individuals' pursuit of excellence. And which we talked about before, pursuit of happiness, which was the realization of excellence. We talked about that before, eudaimonia is happiness, and excellence is areta. And you have this struggle that you go through, this agon, which is agony, you know, this root word, the word, our modern word, agony, in order to realize excellence at the individual level, but it realizes it at a communal level too. But they all had a very strong sense of community. The, pa the strong sense of community was expressed as patriotic feeling and duty towards the, the, the city-states. And they didn't need a whole lot of government institutional regulation of their behavior because of there was a natural pursuit of excellence on the individual level, communal level, city-state level. So, you know, it was... Um, and a lot of this had to do with their approach to education. So there was a book in the early 1900s, early 20th century, I think it was end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, I believe it was, which Don, John Taylor Gatto has got the title of that chapter from. It's called Schools of Hellas. And actually, it was, I think it was an essay. I was looking at it online, not really a book. It was an essay. And then looking about the kind of school system, that the Greek city-states of ancient Athens and Sparta and all the, the rest of the, the city-states. What kind of education system produced this brilliant civilization? And one of the things I'm not going to go into right now, the actual 
essay itself because I'm going to go into John, the elements of it that John Taylor Gatto picked out. I will look, pick out some of my own that I noticed when I read through it myself a little bit later. But one of the things that um, John Taylor Gatto jumped right out at him and he mentioned at the very beginning, you know, there were no schools in Hellas. Not institutional schooling that we know it today. According, one of the things that Gatto pointed out to the Athenians, for schooling for a free person was a revolting idea. They would have been revolted by that kind of thinking. That was an education fit for slaves. You know, poor schooling is something that you force someone to do, whereas education is something you pursue as a lifelong pursuit and is part of the pursuit of happiness. It's part of, part of the realization of excellence. And it's not, it's not something you can, you have educate, you have teaching which is part of it, and they used to, and they have, but education was a very holistic thing. The whole community was involved. You didn't have this school system that was separate from the rest of the community. And so you had these events that were city events, and you had like, you know, there'd be a nar narration, and people would go to it, and then someone would have to give these speeches, and they would, or you had these traveling educators Actually, one of the most famous of them were called sophists, and they were teaching rhetoric, and they had classes that the people, people, and people were lining up and paying money to to buy their classes. And that Socrates, the, the famous Socrates, people thought he was a sophist because his style was different, but his the content was was not. His style was the same, but the content was different. But basically, his difference with them is they charge for their education. So he, Socrates, and later the Platonic. Um, Plato followed up on it, and Aristotle followed up on Plato. They started, they had um, their own education program, but it was a very loose program of people sitting, getting around, very similar to the, in Paris, the, the start of the existentialist movement would be discussions in the cafes of Paris, and the philosophical discussion, uh, movement came out of existentialism. And it wasn't formally coming out of the schooling, it came from these people gathering together and having this passion for philosophy and discussing the nature of human existence. And that was a lot of the education system in ancient Athens. And you had, you had these um, philosophers who would take on young people as men, they would be mentors to them. And, you, you, and the kids, young pe people, they're, um, the idea before you, before you taught people facts and rational decision making, there was music, poetry, drama, dance, stuff like that, because you wanted to mobilize the passions, you can't steer a parked car. And so the idea of building character, you know, religion, morality, and knowledge, you're building character, you're building affinity for what is good and what is bad, and you're building a desire to pursue ereta, excellence, so that you can realize eudaimonia, happiness, or your that was all part of their holistic education system, the, 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 the whole human being. And so that, the um, philosophy of education that was popularized by Socrates, but I think he wasn't the only one who picked up on it, but he was going to popularize it. An educator is a spiritual midwife. In other words, that um, a person is pregnant with knowledge ready to give birth. In other words, knowledge is something that dwell, wells up from within. And a true educator is somebody who helps to bring that out, educate the Latin, I think it's Latin for educare, to bring, to bring forth from within. There's another form of education system that um, some places in the Orient, and um, education is to take installation of knowledge from the teacher into the student. That's where you get the didactic instruction instead of discussion. And there, there are two very, two different modes of, of approaches to education, two different um, theories of how people learn, or even the purpose of education. So the argument that Gatto is making and that I would make is that as we've moved out of the industrial age, I mean out of, into the industrial age, the, before that, you know, the founding fathers wanted a free people. And if, you know, the, the Jefferson said that the, the, the idea that you could be free and be on it and not be educated is something that's never been and never will be. So they wanted 
the free people to be educated in order to pursue happiness, as it says in the Declaration of Independence. And freedom was part of that. So they had this holistic deal. It wasn't just political. It was so education system was to develop human excellence. And so schooling was part of it, yeah, but very minor part of it. Some of our founding fathers were primarily self-educated. One example, he wasn't a founder, but he was um, one of our most well-known presidents, Abraham Lincoln. Most of his education was self-educated. So that was a big part of your, and you constantly pursued education because in the Jeffersonian age, you had a lot of individual employment, individual self-employment, local family businesses, and you're meeting the needs of the community. Maybe you, at one minute you're a blacksmith and another minute you're doing something, a jack of all trades. And you're educating, constantly educating yourself and reinventing yourself to pursue opportunity. And this wasn't seen as a problem. This is one of the things that's seen as a problem now as our industrialized mindset is looking at the information age and we see what is called the gig economy, where young people are jumping from gig to gig. And when they're doing this, now they do this and have to retrain and retrain and retrain and retrain, constant retraining. So our education system, you, you used to be, you know, you school yourself in this and you're set for life, you're set for a career. That's an industrial age mindset. And that's not, that's not the reality that America faced when we were largely a um, self-employed and employment wasn't, you didn't have employment for a large corporation for your life and you, you, you weren't, um, Let's see, you go to school and you study this and you're set. And you don't, after you study this, you don't need to study. But now, you, now you're going to need to be retrained again. So I think more than anything else, if we're going to prepare ourselves for the coming, not coming, is, 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 well, it's still coming because this is in infancy, this information age, digital economy, we're going to have to revamp our education system. We're going to have to stop equating schooling with education and deinstitutionalize it to a certain extent. There's, um, we need to get, a, instill a passion for education in our public. There's been a lot of studies about the reading habits of Americans, and people don't hardly do any reading for, you know, we, you, people, the founding generation, they liked reading, and they read a, extensively. If you read, you look at some of their, um, some of their writings and they're quoting all this literature and stuff like that. So they were very extensively read in the literature of their day. I would say much more so than we are today. And so I'm re reading this study about the, the um, after you get out of school, oh, I don't need to read or study anymore. So it's, and you, you forget all this stuff because people, and one, one argument that's being made is that people are equa equating Reading with forced schooling is that the forced schooling for some people was not a very good experience. It's forced upon them, and you got to go to school. It's compulsory schooling, and so it wasn't something that they wanted to continue. It didn't motivate them. And I there's a lot of studies that the institutionalized approach of schooling is really not the best approach to education, and it's based upon this idea that you're going to people are in a, a Tabular rasa, tabular rasa, blank slate, and you're going to, duty of an educator is to fill up that blank slate with facts and information. And that was the kind of approach to education we used during industrial age. We started to herd people into these schools to get them ready to become um, workers in factories so that we could catch up to the Europeans in this industrial race. And then, so you had the government started to you had, you had this movement of people, they were called Taylorists, and they were um, PhDs in, in business from groups from business schools like Harvard, and they believed because they had the experience of running these large businesses that they, could, that they were more capable of, you had scientific management, and that government should be centrally controlled and managed by experts. And so you, the... The, this, the school system that, that they developed was based upon, and John Taylor Gatto goes into this, and I, I won't go into it a lot because it's a very complicated subject, but John Taylor Gatto goes into this extensively in his book, The Underground History of American Education. And he starts talking about 
education as a tool to prepare us for something. So, so you had a tailorist, and you had this idea that you're going to educate people instead of instead of pursuing willy-nilly their own individual path, you need to collectivize them and pursue a collective path. And so, otherwise we're not gonna catch up to the Europeans in the industrial. So you, you get, they, their curriculum is set for a certain way. And this process was, to a certain extent, copied by the progressives, but with a different outcome. Well, we gotta, we have to school them and get them ready to become citizens in the social democracy. And so one, uh, the means were the same, the ends were different. Um, instead of having business, titans of business being the ones, who, the experts running society, you had social engineers who were, um, who were specialists in the social sciences. But again, it was ruled by expert, and again, if you know, someone wanna get a hold of me, I have, you go to our website and I, I believe it's got my email address. I got an article that was written about this, this whole notion of rule by experts, that is both the tailors and progressives of the late 19th century, early 20th century, were seeing as the most orderly way to run a society. For the, for the, um, for the tailors, they're looking at an orderly society that is gonna be prepare, prepare us to become industrial powerhouse. For the progressives, well, that was partially for progressives wanted progress and progress in the industrial age, meaning being, but you also, they wanted social justice, which is a great idea, but their idea of achieving it was through experts defining what it was and getting us to be educated. So the other flip side of that coin is that instead of educating people to become cogs in either an industrial or a political machine. You, you educate people for excellence and that you, you instill in them a passion for education and a passion, for, and you, you make the case that education, the purpose of education is the pursuit of excellence. And it should, the Northwest Ordinance, um, this is something that was brought up by our American founders when we created the Nor wrote out the Northwest Ordinance. Northwest Ordinance is when we're going to buy some more property up in Northwest Territories to expand the United States and become big, bigger. And so part of, I can't remember the whole thing, but the part of that that sticks out to me is that religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary for, for good government and the happiness of all mankind. So in other words, because we believe this, then s schools and, means of it, and the means of education will be encouraged. Well, schools and the means of education, and that is not, they didn't just say schools and the means of education. Schools is part of education. And education supposedly is gonna to touch on religion, morality, and knowledge. Now by religion, I'm not talking about an institutional thing. We've talked before about religion as the human experience of transcendence. Morality is the um, owner's manual that helps you to transcend, you, you transcend your relationship with others. And then you have knowledge. Knowledge, human beings are not just like animals. Animals have a very short period of maturation. You get, they get ready to go out and kill and eat and hunt or whatever they need to do. And their, their maturation period is very short. And it's not as complex as the human matur maturation period. The human child goes through a long process before they're ready to become an adult and live in a human society because, and a lot of that process is education because human beings, instead of having thick fur or weapons, you know, like big teeth and claws and so that we claw our way to uh, success or defend ourselves that way. Human beings shape their environment. We, in, in order to, you know, it's cold out, instead of having thick, thick fur, we, fur, we build, we build ho houses, we have heating systems. Um, if the water is polluted, we filtrate it, filter it, and we improve upon it and make it cleaner. Suppose, now, this is what is referred to as stewardship. Stewardship has an ec, um, a, uh, religious connotation, but it also has a connotation of effective management of resources. So it's a very broad term that religious people use for the human responsibility to exercise stewardship over the environment, much like a gardener would with a garden. So 
part of this education system is recognition that human beings are different than animals. So that's the kind of knowledge that it requires the, hum the morality, religion, morality, and finally the knowledge. And that knowledge has to do with the fact that we need, we need to go through a process and being able to shape the environment around us. We need to constantly adapt. So this is an education system for, for the 21st century information age is going to be one that doesn't end, begin and end with classroom hours. And I, I think a lot of people are interested in what is referred to as school choice. And I, I think that's an important part of it. I think having um, more educational options is very important because the more diversity of educational options you have, the better. And I, but I wouldn't call it, I would refer to, I like the term educational choice because I don't necessarily believe that, that schooling is the only form that education has to come from. You, that you're still, in homeschoolers, that, in homeschooling, they sometimes refer to a process of what they call unschooling. And so I, I think a network, an educational network, where you have religious leaders and you uh, representatives of the religious community, representatives of the business community, representatives of a lot of these different voluntary associations like Grange Hall and stuff like that, reach out and create educational opportunities for kids. And you, this doesn't have to be limited to geographical area because we have an informa information age, we have all the social media. My son, I started learn, getting him into Google and um, Google search and YouTube and to teach him to teach himself. I mean, he, he is going to school, but by God, he learns a lot more from Google than he does either from me or from school. He, or actually, YouTube is even more so. YouTube is a big thing. He's making his own YouTube shows. But if you go look something up and he'll show it to me and he'll, he'll, he'll tell me about something. And I say, no, that can't be. Yes, it is. And he shows me. And he's, he's only 12 years old. And this is the... This is the way that, that we've got to, we've got to instill in our kids this passion. And you make the available, all these tools are available. I mean, kids love playing games, but the games, the kid will, my kid will come to me and he one asks about time travel. So we'll talk about the physics of time travel. Or he'll, in some game, he was talking about some kind of teleportation device. Well, how would that work? And so we start talking about it in terms of the science of, of how, how it would work if it was real. And finding ways to take things like that, video games, and how, how, how would you turn that into an educational experience? Um, they like playing, there's this card game, it's called UVO. He wants me to get a deck and play with him. It, you have monsters and you have dragons and you have magical beings and I don't know much about it, but and you war with one another by, by, by summoning this and putting your card down and this trumps this and don't ask me anymore. <laughs> but that has connection with some of our literature, fantasy literature. And so, you know, this is... Um, we, we've got to, as a society, we've got to figure out um, okay, you got the SpaceX, Elon Musk SpaceX, the, the launch of the, um, what was it, Falcon X or Falcon Heavy, I forgot which one, Falcon, Falcon X to, to Mars, and it's on its way, and it's got, it's got the, the uh, Tesla Roadster in it, and it's traveling. That was fascinating. A lot of people are watching that. I showed it to my son, who's very interested in it, and during the six, late 60s, you had this Star Trek, space, the final frontier, and this captured people's imagination. And then, then um, Jonathan Ken, John Kennedy picked up on this, and he became, you know, ca he captured people's imagination. And he says, "We're going to do, go to the moon and do the other things, not because they're easy, because they're hard." And he captured the imaginations of a generation of young people. And but that became pe people's people's energy and, and imagination was funneled into NASA, but NASA never ended up, we had the space race against Russia, and then what? So now you've got these entrepreneurs who are envisioning commercial 
com commercial um, of uh, colonization of space. And see, SpaceX is just one of them. You got these guys who are going into this asteroid mining to get resources from nearest asteroids. There's, and that's just one example. There's a lot of exciting things that are going on technologically. Why don't we create a series like Star Trek, Mars, the final frontier, or something? There are so many things going on in technological field that are fascinating and they're just crying out for a Star Trek series to be made about them. And to capture the generation of the interest and, to, and we could um, spark the interest in education about these kind of things. You could have fantasy, you know, it could be technology based, it could be fantasy based, literature based. And, you know, I was reading this, there's this piece about parents, large parent number of parents would like their kids to become entrepreneurs, but the kids don't share those dreams. And the kids, one, afraid of the risk, two, there's no um, role models that they have. They don't, they don't know how to go about it. They don't have the proper support, support from either parents or the school. And their, their, teacher, their, their, their peers aren't into this. And it's no surprise. We, we idolize celebrities, but we don't have a similar thing where we where is the process? I, I guess Elon Musk has become somewhat of a celebrity to a certain extent. But wh where do we find a way to allow entrepreneurs to share what they're doing with our younger generation to, to stimulate their imagination? Instead of that, we got this phrase that um, in a lot of political circles, that, th that those who became rich need to give back to the community. Now, that's a nice thing, giving back to the community, but you're assuming in t give back, and assuming in becoming rich, you took it from the community. Well, it's a possibility that maybe in becoming, not only are you, giving, are you bringing jobs to the community, but you're bringing entrepreneurship, you're bringing energy, you're bringing products, you're bringing, um, I mean, it's not, it's not all, I mean, there's, it's not without its pitfalls, but there is, in some senses, we've got this mentality that anti-business, that business equals greed, and we don't talk about the ingenuity and the creativity and the, you know, space, the final frontier. <clears throat> the government hasn't been too good in doing that, but now private businesses are realizing that dream. Where is the celebration of that? Where is the equivalent of the Star Trek series? So I think we have the tools to educate ourselves and, and motivate ourselves to be ready for the information age digital economy. But we don't have the mindset. We're still looking at an industrial age model and we're still waiting for big government, big schooling, or you know, maybe, maybe we should have this international um, regulations to pr make sure that people don't be left behind. And it's not gonna work. And I've said that before. And t t tonight I want to suggest to you that we have the tools in the information age, we have social media, we have people like, you, you, you get all these entrepreneurs who are, um, uh, who are um, tailor-made to create a Star Trek movie based upon similar, you know, uh, and yeah, so I, I think that our mindset, if we change our mindset, then a lot of the opportunities in the information age will become, will come to the front stronger and a lot of the um, pitfalls will become, will become less. I mean, just the mining of resources in near-order asteroids, there's trillions of dollars worth of re re resources that we don't have on Earth. There's some excitement right there. Now, as we go on, we're gonna look at different aspects of what's going on in technology and take a look at it and how it could be useful to us. Well, this has been Operation City on the Hill, January edition. We will be back next month, and I think I'm going to start talking about the industrial aid, I mean the enlightenment and religion and science. Thank you very much, and have a nice night.